we're recording. Cool. So, the interviewer is Christian Wright. Today is November 16th, 2020, and uh, we're recording this over WebEx. And if you could please introduce yourself. All right. So, my name is Dirk Rupe. I'm an associate professor of astrophysics and space science at the Space Science Center at Moet State. So, I'm with the Department of Physics, Earth Science, and Space System Engineering. And um, do you live in Moorhead or in the surrounding area? I sometimes live in Moorhead when I was teaching, uh, you know, face to face. I uh, live in Moorhead right behind the Space Science Center. And uh, then I'm staying there for the week. My family lives in Lexington. That's where I am right now. So now I'm spending most of the time in Lexington because all, all my stuff I'm doing is, you know, via WebEx, Zoom, whatever. So everything is online. Yes. And um, I actually just got an email from the university right before this started that everyone has to move online uh, for the last two days of the semester. Correct. Uh, I was actually there. I was at the PLC meeting just an hour ago, and the president announced that. Yep. Um, how long have you worked for the university? I started in August 2014, so it's uh, six and a half years by now. And uh, now we'll move into the COVID questions. Um, when did you first hear about the coronavirus? And when you heard about it, kind of what were you thinking? When I first heard about it, it was probably back in January. Um, and uh, I first thought, well, you know, it's another outbreak in China, right? We had that a few years ago with SARS, maybe in 2002, or like, you know, with Ebola in Africa, 2000, whatever, 13 or whenever that was. And yeah, you know, it's probably contained. It's probably some chicken stuff that comes out again from some market there. And uh, nobody would expect it that this would go viral virtually speaking, it would go all around the world. But that was probably about January that I heard about it the first time. And then um, they kind of became apparent in March that the university wasn't coming back from our spring break. Um, how did that affect your job? Um, for me, it was, uh, was some transition because some of my classes were, were face to face. Um, at the time, I was teaching, what, five classes, I believe, five or six classes. I don't remember anymore. Um, and uh, two of them were already online. Um, no, one, uh, I'll take it back. One was already online, and the rest I had to convert. Now, fortunately, most of these were the Jeanette classes, which I already taught online. So converting those to an online setting was relatively straightforward, I would say. The class that needed a little bit more work was the introductory astronomy class, the continuation of our introductory astronomy class, the Astro 130 class, uh, which is typically a face-to-face -face class. So switching that online, that took a little bit of work. Uh, but what I did at the end was I was just teaching it at the same time uh, and then, you know, recorded those lectures and post them on Blackboard. And um, were you kind of moving in that direction on your own anyway when it looked like COVID was starting to become worldwide? Yes, I did. I, you know, when I heard about this, that this would be going, you know, uh, really out of control already in March, I was pretty sure that after March, uh, you know, after spring break, we probably would not come back. And so, so you know, um, to some degree, yes, I was, I wasn't too surprised. I was actually pretty prepared for this and came up with a plan already what, what I would do. And then, you know, uh, I don't remember when we even switched to officially online. That was even before spring break that we got the email that nobody comes back after spring break, as far as I remember. And um, again, for me, switching then to online was, for me, was not such a big deal. I mean, it was a big deal for a lot of colleagues, uh, especially if you deal with labs, if you deal with any kind of hand-on experience, that was a challenge. And uh, like everything at that time, I mean, for many people, it didn't work out that well. Uh, but that's normal, right? I mean, it's the same thing with the schools, with the public schools, with the K-12 schools. Uh, they had a terrible time after spring break, after March. Um, now they know what they are doing. I mean, it's, it's of course, adjusted to this now. And um, around the March time frame, when the U.S. did their uh, kind of attempt at a national lockdown, um, how was daily life for you like then? And kind of how did it change from normal life? Well, 
the the normal life i would say is that i typically stay during the week in moorhead right and this basically flipped everything around now all of a sudden i was pretty much being in lexington all the time i went back to moorhead once in a while because i'm uh, building 3d satellites th satellite models at the space science center so i still had to go there for printing 3d parts but coming back to campus uh, at that time in particular right after march uh, april was kind of weird because it was even you know more quiet than when you are on campus during the summer month there was pretty much nobody there um it was kind of really strange really strange feeling um and the the rest changed well uh you when when you go to the store you wear a mask uh, something you wouldn't do i mean you saw always that uh, it, it's in the asian cultures that a lot of asian people they always wear masks during winter time when there is flu season or whatever which you know is a good precaution and we always probably laughed at these guys before and now all of a sudden everybody is doing it because or most people are doing it because it's the best thing to do to protect yourself and others from from the disease and um kind of moving through the summer and up into this uh, semester we're in right now um how did you prepare your classes for that? And uh, just kind of how was life adjusting to the pandemic? Um, the classes, again, was relatively straightforward because I was, first of all, I was only teaching three classes at the time because I'm faculty senate president right now. So I get release time on this. Um, and the, the two classes I have at the time are genetic classes. So those switching those online was relatively simple again, because I was teaching those classes online anyway before, at least, you know, to some degree. Uh, and then the only challenge was the astrodynamics class, which uh, what I do with this class is I teach it online by having a live session. So I'm doing a live recording. It's not uh, synchronous. The students ha don't have to be there, but they can be there and can ask questions. So that transition went, went, I would say, really smooth, uh, and it worked. It's more work. Uh, I can tell you this right away. If people think if you are online teaching, it's less work, it's actually not the case because you have to give the students feedback. You have to do this on an individual basis, and uh, it can eat up a lot of time giving the students, especially for when you have math problems and stuff like that, to give them give them feedback. It's much more complicated than you think. Uh, than if I get this on a written piece of paper and you you write this down. Uh, I'm much quicker with this, or you know, with the genetic classes, with the with the math problems, you just go through the list and zack 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 and write something down quickly. You know, if you grade an exam, for example, that is typically you know half an hour, you're done. But with with this setting, oh, it takes me a significant longer time because you have to answer the emails, you have to tell the people in an email what's going on, and then otherwise in over the summer, you know, changes in life. Yeah, well. Uh, what we used to do over the summer here in Lexington is go to concerts, freeze concerts, and that, of, of course, is all being cancelled. I mean, you spend most of the time in the house now, except for going out, going for a walk uh, to get some fresh air. But, you know, I mean, for us, um, it was basically, yeah, you sit in the house, but you know what, I can do my work from the house. So it's, uh, it's, it's for me, it's not that bad, honestly. And um, how has your department had to adapt to the pandemic? I think challenging because we have a lot of classes that require labs. When you look at the physics lab, all our physicists in our department, they had to come up uh, in March in particular. That was challenging because they had to come up with some adoption. Now they can do the labs in person, you know, until of course this Friday, but I think they are done on, on Friday. They have only finals uh, on, on Monday and Tuesday. So they're actually in a good shape. Um, the same thing with the space science, uh, with the space system engineering part, uh, because it involves things like soldering, right? And ex hands-on experience. And in March and April, there was no way you could give this to the students. So this was, of course, not really, um, you know, what 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 was expected. Um, the biggest challenge was the social distancing, I think, because the problem is that you can only fit a third of the students into the class, into the classrooms, into the labs. And that makes a total mess, right? In particular on faculty, because now all of a sudden faculty have to teach three times as much and probably something you're not aware of. When you teach a lab, you don't get full credit for this. You only get uh, half an hour or, 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 or 40 minutes of workload credit 
for a lab hour that for an hour that you spend in a lab. So now not only that, that faculty had to teach those classes three times, they are basically don't get any credit for it. You can imagine you know, how much work this makes with this kind of setting. Yeah, I can imagine how uh, work really starts to pile up. And uh, I think we've oh, all yeah. a piece of that this semester. But um, how did uh, the pandemic affect the faculty senate? And what did you guys have to do to kind of acclimate to that? Um, the biggest change was we don't have in-person meetings anymore. We do the meetings now via WebEx. But that has been actually working out quite well. We had some hiccups at the beginning in particular. Um, sometimes you you don't have the right link or you know you have the typical stuff can you hear me or that you have some people have some internet connectivity problems like what you were telling me about your home that's of course a challenge uh the biggest issue we ran into at the beginning was also that our uh, was was simply voting system you know because this was not set up in in webex and um, apparently no webex has a voting system now you know we used it actually in the last senate meeting um but that was not available when we started with this, you know, back in April or even at the beginning of this semester. But other than that, the meetings are actually working quite well because, you know, I have colleagues who are living here in Lexington who usually, you know, couldn't come to the or had to drive back to to Moid for the Senate meeting. Now they do it from whatever, right? I mean, in some ways it makes it easier because having the WebEx meeting, we had to usually meet in a room in ADAC and uh now we just do it webex you know it's works works as well the only thing i mean now that we have the voting system even on webex available it's i would say pretty much it's the same thing and um kind of going through the course of the pandemic uh, i know state and federal kind of guidelines and recommendations have differed uh sometimes greatly from each other uh how have you kind of mm -hmm. navigated going through that well, you 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 follow the I would say you follow the the guidelines that are coming from the from the Kentucky governor because that that was usually the one that was right on par with any kind of health expert what they are telling you, which means wear a mask wherever you go. Um, outside, of course, you know when you're just going for a walk, that's not necessary. But when you go to stores, when you are in classrooms, whatever, you wear a mask because that's the best protection you can you can get, and then you know, keep basically keep away from people, avoid travel as much as possible. Uh, at this time, it's not really, you know, that's much of a good idea to travel, although it becomes more challenging now, right, with having Thanksgiving and Christmas coming up, where people traditionally travel to family events. And yeah, that could be a headache in the next couple couple of weeks. Yeah, uh, it's definitely going to be an interesting time post Christmas. Mm -hmm. And uh, both yep. because how infectious the virus is and hopefully a couple vaccines will be out. Well, that's the only positive note right now because we heard from two companies who have vaccines which might be 95% uh, receptive, which is good. Uh, the question is, of course, how do you, de how do you um, deploy that? You have to also keep in mind you have to cool these vaccines down to what, minus 70 degrees Celsius or something like that. Um, the other thing is you need two shots, right? You need also keep track of the people who got a shot before they have to come back three weeks after. It's basically like a tetanus shot, right? Which which requires three shots. Um, and um, that's the same thing here. So you have to keep track of the people who get, uh, uh, vaccine, uh, uh, who get the vaccine, who get immunized. And uh, to keep track of that, that will be probably still a logistical nightmare mm -hmm. to make sure that the people are coming back because otherwise it's pretty useless, right? Oh, yeah, hundred percent. And um, <laughs> if you don't uh, mind, kind of comparing and contrasting uh, the U.S. and Germany's response to uh, COVID, yeah. for me, that was interesting because uh, when you look at the U.S., the U.S. has about four times as much inhabitants as Germany does. Germany has about eighty-two thousand. Um, when you compare the numbers there, uh, Germany has. You know, the U.S. has about 20, 22 times more inf infections and 22 times more deaths than Germany does. Um, they got it pretty much under control, which, you know, it's not as politi politicized than it is here, where people think that wearing a mask is a political statement. 
Um, the other thing is simply the trust in the government. No matter which party is actually ruling, there is still some you know, underlying trust in the government. What the guys are doing is actually in the interest of the people. And here you don't see this, right? You see this, that people are having clash against each other if you wear a mask or not, that this is seen as, as a political statement. Now, there are some idiots in Germany, too, who don't want to wear a mask. You know, the right wing uh, population there does the same kind of stupid things as the people do here with not wearing a mask. Uh, you see this, that they think their freedom is taken away. But, uh, you know, the general census is that you wear a mask Otherwise, you end up with a, in a more severe lockup. And um, that helped Germany to navigate, or Europe for the most part, navigate uh, through this crisis. Um, the other big issue is that uh, is, is simply the healthcare system, where you have a universal healthcare system. Uh, so people are not afraid becoming unemployed as much as they are here, because if once you get unemployed here, you lose your healthcare benefits and you are on the street, basically, right? Uh, and then if you get infected by the virus, then you have to go to a hospital or you need any kind of treatments, you're basically bankrupt. And that's taken care of. Uh, so, you know, when, when they locked down, they also took the, they just didn't just lock down the, the, the companies or the, 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 the business. They also took care that the people still remained employed. There's a system in Germany in place before the people even get un unemployed, um, which uh, is 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 you have this always for some kind of crisis that that companies can apply for this kind of money so they keep the people employed but this the, the government is actually paying those people so the money is given to the companies and then the companies can still pay the people and i think that helped a lot to keep the unemployment rate also on a reasonable level there are still people unemployed and people became unemployed but it's not in that in fact that we have seen here in the u.s and um I know it looks like Europe has entered their second wave and uh, the U.S. is constantly breaking uh, 100,000 cases a day and setting new records. Um, just kind of what are your thoughts on the virus's resurgence? It's it's really sad because we should have figured out by now that, you know, the best way is stay at home, wear a mask. It's it's not in, in some ways it's not that complicated, right? You don't have to go to very extreme ma ma measures. You still can go to stores. It's not like those are locked down, but you know, just don't have a wedding right now, at least not with a hundred people, you know, um, postpone it, have the party later, uh, things like that. You know, it's, you know, you want to keep yourself safe. You want to keep the people, you know, safe, um, you know, be, Unfortunately, it surges everywhere, right? The question is how fast, how quick this curve uh, uh, expands, you know, because it's an expo exponential law, right? It's an exponential growth law. And, and humans have problems with doing this. Most people have problems with dealing with exponents. And it's, you know, if you go into log space, you see what the, what the, how, how the slope looks like, right? As an astronomer, you do this all the time, right? Um, and the question is, you know, how fast is, is your curve really growing? How fast you can this actually keep this under control? Because there are other problems, right? Because um, once your your growth is too steep, the problem is the whole, the hospitals are totally overrun. It's not only that you have enough rooms. Uh, we had a actually a very nice talk by Dr. Stack the other week during the Kentucky Academy of Science meeting. And he was pointing out one problem is not necessarily the rooms or the incubators that you are not the incubators, the ICUs that you have. It's your personal. How many trained nurses do you have that can actually deal with these kind of patients? And you don't. And that's that's your limiting factor. So if you're overrun with this, you cannot just, you know, grab a normal nurse from uh, from a nursery and put them into an ICU. That's not going to work because that's not how they these people are trained. Right. So you need trained people for this, and that's your limiting factor. So as long as we can keep this down, you know, and don't overrun the hospitals, because there are other crises, you know, they, you have a car accident still, you have other things, people have heart attacks, you know, strokes, they still have to be taken care of, and all of a sudden nobody is there to take care of these guys. Um, yeah, that's definitely a predicament we hope we don't find ourselves again, or in. I hope not, you know. <laughs> but, um... And uh, have you found enough information uh, available on COVID? Do you? Like I said, that really weird. Yeah, but I know what you mean. I think there is a lot of information available. 
Um, you know, you check the, you can check the Kentucky, uh, you know, the governor's webpage. Uh, look at this, the information that is provided by Dr. Stack. Um, you know, I get my, my information also from the New York Times, from the Atlantic, from the German news magazine, Der Spiegel. There is a, there's a lot of online materials available. And, and again, I mean, some of the rules are, are relatively simple. Just keep away from everybody <laughs> as much as you can. Uh, discuss things, meet people online. You know, I know it's, it's tough for many people to do that, but you know, it's, it's the safest for everybody if you do this, because you don't want to, I mean, if, if you have it, you don't want to infect somebody else. And uh, you may have it and you don't know about it because you cannot test every day. Um, and you know, some of the cases are asymptomatic and you don't know if you have it and you come in contact with somebody who is more receptive than you are and has uh, pre-existing conditions. And you know what, you might've killed somebody there right away. I mean, literally speaking, because the pe person, if you can avoid it, if you can avoid the contact, I know it's not good. I know it's not nice, especially these days with Thanksgiving and Christmas coming up, but what's the, what's the choice, you know? I mean, next year, hopefully everything looks better. Hopefully we have the vaccine ready. And most of the people are, you know, immunized by next year. But for the time being, I would be very cautious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And um, how do you feel the pandemic has changed how you use technology? And uh, is there anything you're going to carry on into the future post pandemic? I think so. I think now everybody is uh, is familiar with Zoom, with Webex, having meetings now uh, online, having meeting, I mean, uh, scientific meetings online. I participated just recently in two scientific meetings, one in Germany, actually, which I haven't participated in 19 years. And um, it started basically already uh, in March. I was on a NASA panel and we were supposed to meet somewhere, you know, physically. And that was from one day to the next was then totally switched online. And guess what? It worked. We were very skeptical about it, but it worked. Uh, I had another NASA panel uh, review panel in June, and that worked, you know, flawlessly because by that time people have learned how to adjust to this. I will be on another one sometime in March, and uh, my guess it will be turning just smooth. Uh, so this technology with using Zoom, with using WebEx, which before had been used only, you know, to some degree. Uh, has also improved. I mean, the, tech, the the features that you have like on WebEx or on Zoom, they have improved, uh, like the voting, the you know, the ability to vote online has really improved. Things like that have been developed. Even when you look behind me, my background, right? When we started out with WebEx, we couldn't upload a web uh, uh, background. Zoom allowed that, but WebEx didn't. So I would see this is, is something that continues uh, really past pandemic in many ways. In, in, in ways that we, you know, do our work, we can do more work remotely. We figured this out. The pandemic pushed us into this, um, that we cannot, we don't need to commute as much anymore that, you know, if you have, you know, some kind of office job, why not do some of your work or most of your work from home? Why do you have to go to an office at a specific time anymore? It doesn't matter, right? I mean, as long as you get the work done and you can do this at home um, and and you know meetings you can still have you can do them with zoom or webex works much better and and also you know the way we teach same thing you know before i was teaching um in winter i was teaching online in summer i was teaching online i had uh one or two classes during the semester online but most of the classes were were still face to face but now this changed right because it gives everybody more flexibility at least from my perspective and probably also from some students perspective and, and you know that that you know you can take the class whenever, whenever fits your schedule. And when you look also into the future, our normal student body is declining, right? When you look at the high school students, that body is declining. So we have to look more into adult learners. And these guys don't have time, you know. They have to look on their work schedule. They have work to do normally. They have families to take care of. And for them, you know, having the flexibility with an online class is, of course, just advantageous. And so we, we can tap into a totally new market here when we when we go online, when we do more classes online. And again, for the students, I mean, do you really want to have a face-to-face -face chemistry class at, six, at, at eight o'clock in the morning? Probably not, right? Or write a final at eight o'clock? Probably not either. So 
with doing this online, you know, you have much more flexibility. So I think I think for the future, we will we will see more things going online. And we see this all around us, right? I mean, look at shopping. Who goes to a shopping mall? Nobody, right? I mean, you you order the stuff online. Um, who depends on a TV schedule anymore? Nobody, right? Because you zoom your you 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 stream your stuff on Netflix and and Prime and Amazon, um, and uh, or or Hulu and whatever. And you know, we are so used to these 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 streaming channels now or listening to music. I mean. <laughs> Many people don't buy CDs anymore. They stream the stuff. They stream the music, and um, you know it's it goes the same thing. I think with higher education that we have seen with banks, with malls, with newspapers. I mean, I read all my newspapers online. I don't have a subscription in a hard copy form. Um, so that has changed. Banks, you know, the whole travel industry, everything is is changing and uh, is is going more online. There are disadvantages to it, sure, but on the other hand, it gives you also a high degree of flexibility this way. Definitely, it's a it's a good trend on some sides. Um, there's some negatives that come with it too, obviously. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. With everything, right? I think, <laughs> I think the benefits definitely outweigh the uh, negatives. And um, if you don't mind me asking, how has COVID affected uh, you and your family? Uh, it affected us in, well, not that we were infected so far, but you, you are very cautious. I mean, um, going out, you know, as I said, we have not been to restaurants or whatever since this started. Uh, if you go to restaurants, go to restaurants is basically you take out some stuff, you order stuff online and then you pick it up. Um, the concerts are out. Uh, the other thing is my son, my younger son here has sometimes he has a sleepover, but not as frequent as it used to be. You have it and then not as many people anymore. So you have a very, very small contents area with people who you know that they can be more or less trusted. Right. I mean, uh, that's that's really the in, in you, you basically pretty much try to live in this kind of bubble, so to speak. And that's probably the biggest uh, challenge or the biggest, you know, adjustment that we had, because in, in particular for, for the younger one here who uh, went to pretty much sleepovers all the time, or at some point we had five kids over here, you know, uh, things like that. That's not going to happen. It's only one kid at the time, because you really have to limit that. That wouldn't be not good if you have five kids over here right now. And um, is there anything else you'd like to talk about or add? I, I don't think so. I think we covered everything. Uh, it's a challenging time, you know. But you know, look at the bright side. There are what we just recently, just in one of the last questions discussed. There are some things where um, every crisis is a challenge, right? And out of every crisis, you can get some positive out of it. I mean, I'm not saying that this whole thing was positive because we lost just in this country 250,000 people so far, which is, you know, certainly not positive. Uh, it's a very sad thing, to be honest. Um, and but the positive thing is that we saw technological developments, and uh, that you know will you know keep going for the future as well, and it will change things. Like like with every kind of challenge or every kind of catastrophe, um, it will change things, and hopefully you know it will change us to the good. And uh, you know we we work with the new technologies that we have right now. Because, I mean, you're right. I mean, there are disadvantages to it as well. But on the other hand, um, it enables us to do things that we were not thinking, you know, a year ago uh, that we would be able to do this. Well, um, thank you for your time. And Thank you, Christian. Okay. Bye. <laughs>